All right, let's approach the throne, shall we? Our Father, we thank you very kindly for the day. It is a day that no man has seen. It is a day that no man has expected. We thank you very kindly for who you are and what you've done and what you are doing. For your very character, for your very attributes, for your eternality, for your promises to us. We thank you for saving us out of the kingdom of darkness and making us children of light. We thank you for adopting us as sons and daughters. We thank you for uniquely setting us aside as the body and bride of your son. How could we possibly not be grateful people? For those uh, amongst us who are uh, suffering with loss, suffering with health, it is our want as fallen creatures. It is what we have to look forward to here in this strange place in which we sojourn called Earth. And we will do so by your grace and by your power for as long as you would have us here. <clears throat> and it's certainly your will, not ours. But any time you want to have the archangel blow that trumpet, we're ready to go. We look forward to the imminent return of our king because we're tired of the rule and reign of the prince of power of the earth. As we look into your scriptures, we, as always, pray that you keep us from error, that you give us a spirit of clarity, and that what uh, is said will have been of the Holy Spirit, and that will be received with open ears and receptive hearts. For all of this, we give you praise. For we bring these requests and these prayers to you in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, we are in chapter 12, if you can believe it. Moving right along. We were in chapter 12. Oh, sorry, chapter 6. I was looking at verse 12. Dreamer. Chapter whatever, verses 12 through 17, all right? actually chapter 6, right, Katie? Yes. Right. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs dropped from, the, from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide, from, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Okay, we covered the introductory material last week. How we thought it might be a cool bumper sticker. Beware the wrath of the lamb. You probably get some questions, don't you think? Yeah. We mentioned that the sixth seal is uh, the first among the six where we see God personally intervene in the workings and history <clears throat> of mankind. We start out with a great earthquake. What was the question last week? Was that your question? Not about the earthquake, about the sky. When oh. the sky recedes as a scroll, when it is rolled up, every mountain and island was moved out of its place. So are they moved out of their place because the sky's been moved? Or oh. are they physically moved out of place as part of this? Got it. Got it. So, <clears throat> you'll have to come back next week to give the answer. <laughs> 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 In other words, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. 
<laughs> You'll hear that from me a lot. You've already heard that from me a lot, haven't you? I don't know. All right, there's basically two um, trains or paths, <clears throat> excuse me, of thought relative to what's going on here in the opening of the sixth seal. <clears throat> one of which is literal and one of which is symbolic. My contention is and, and has always been that the book of Revelation is much more literal than we would like to think and that when it is symbolic it will tell us so with similes and metaphors and such. All right, so, for example, somebody raise their hand and tell me what this means. Go ahead, Pam. So this is the letter V for victory. Peace. Okay. Peace. Go ahead. Peace. 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 Block signs. Door track. Okay. No. That's the middle fingers. Hang on. Hang on, Barry. Don't do it. They all need to go on the board. Second coming. Second coming. You're two years old. Second. Throw a curveball. In the sign in, in in the American Sign Language, this is a letter V. This is a letter K. Very subtle, right? Uh huh. You have one? Yeah, in elementary school, it's something you use to keep all the classes quiet. Quiet? Yeah. Dears, ears. No, we use them in science so please be quiet and listen. Be quiet and listen. I gotta go number two, not number one. <laughs> so, so I do that. I do that to illustrate the challenge of symbolizing something without context. I gave you no context whatsoever when I stuck up two fingers, and you did as bad a job with this as you did with the word read, or read, or whatever it was. Do you understand how important context is, right? Because this means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, whether you're being serious or whether you're trying to make a joke, Scott, right? Or Mike, or whoever. Between the two of you guys, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Put it. <laughs> Susie, just like a little sister, wants me to put his name on the board. She doesn't want me to be lonely up there. Yeah. Yeah. So I will tell you that my that my position on this is that of, that of one that is literal. These judgments were intended for those who dwell upon the earth. So it, make, it would make no sense to me and uh, to make them symbolic. Uh, okay, so in scripture, mountains have been used as symbolic of governments. Islands have been used symbolic of municipalities or the powers within municipalities or cities. That is when it also provides you the context of such symbolism. And that is where folks, that is where some uh, theologians camp is on this side of symbolism. Well, these are governments and these are, I mean, okay. However, I don't think the common man is that astute, quite frankly, right, to get the message. And the common man that God is interested in, in here, interested in, yeah, okay, is the nation Israel. 
And he has made certain promises to the nation of Israel, and we'll get to those a little later, that the sixth seal either violates or fulfills. Because the promise used the words until. Until these certain things happen. So those are the promises that were made to God, to, to the nation of Israel. Perhaps the most convincing reason to take the events of this seal literally comes from the words of somebody I think who we can trust. And Jesus said them in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, verse 7, when he said, <clears throat> uh, he talks about the coming earthquakes. His language in that context could hardly be taken as figurative. A, sim a suggestion of combining both literal and figurative uh, is fraught with her hermeneutical difficulty. It is not exegesis, it is epigesis, whereby you insert meaning rather than dig meaning out of. All right? We're in a business of exegesis, not the other. That is not to say that the literal earthquakes, the literal uh, volcanic eruptions, the literal shaking of the Teutonic plates, the, literally, the literal falling of objects from the heavens cannot also have consequences in the, sim the symbolic, such as governments. I don't imagine governments will go on as business as usual after these sorts of things are happening, because as we will see, of the seven categories of people that are seeking refuge in the very things that are falling down around them, five of those seven categories are the wealthy and those who are in power. So the first people to, to uh, head for cover would be, oh, I don't know, the Senate. <laughs> There's also a precaution against stark literalism. Paul does use hyperbole. When he talks about every mountain, does he mean every mountain? Well, he can't possibly, otherwise there would be no mountains to hide these folks who are seeking refuge. So I look about the class and the chairs are full and it would appear that everybody is in attendance. Really? Okay, so there's some, there's some there's some usage of hyperbole here. Could be that every mountain that John saw, all right? Could be it appeared as if every mountain, all right? And we will get more into that a little later. The falling of the stars and the rolling up of the heaven are only apparent. If moving on mountains and islands from their places in 614 were universal and complete, there would be no hiding places left for men to see, verses 15 and 16. At the same time, the phenomena are so severe that they are unparalleled in human history. The English word is thought by some, uh, the English word earthquake is thought by some as not completely describing the seal because the heavens are shaken along with the seas and the dry ground. One suggested man, uh, rendering of this word is convulsion. Now, I did some little bit of homework and the Greek word for convulsion and the Greek word for earthquake are different. Your Greek word for earthquake is seismos, from which we get seismology. And the Greek word for Convulsion is anastatis. I'll get better as I use it. That Greek word is only found four times in the New Testament. In each of those four renderings, it is translated terror. 
there was a tearing. And this is why one, um, I think it's one. No, it doesn't matter. This is why some theologians would indicate that it is more than an earthquake, that is a convulsion that is happening with the opening of the sixth seal. Okay, fine, if you, uh, but, the, but the earthquake and the tearing of the heavens are two separate events taken to get that together. They can very easily see how somebody would consider that a convulsion because the entire body or the entire earth, if you will, the entire creation is, is being shivered. All right? Yes? Mind if I toss something in from science that it, it, this just remind me of a, a great coronal material ejection. Sunspots are black. A bigger sunspot black could be seen as the sun turning black. If the coronal ejection is aimed at Earth, it would not only cut out all of our electronics, it would probably heat the Earth up, boil the oceans, turn everything upside down, no place to hide, um, maybe even cause tectonic plates to move. That's a tremendous energy that would be thrown at the Earth. God controls everything. I doubt that's what he means, but who knows? God, uh, anyway. Well, you know, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, and that comes later. Yeah. Right? When when the restraints that God the, the the balance between our distance and our can't from that from the sun is so minute that any any infinitesimal change of that could be catastrophic for the atmosphere and the inhabitants on this planet. And so there's also, and I'll, I'll tell you this now, even though it comes up later in our lesson, and maybe I've spoken of this before, it is this thing referred to as crustal tide. And <clears throat> there is empirical data to indicate that the orbit of Mars did not always uh, occupy the track that it does now, and that in eons past, it came much closer to Earth than it does now. The result of that very large body and the gravi gravitational forces of that very large body at its, what would that be, apogee or nadir, when it's closest to the nadir, nadir would, would literally cause the ground to rise up in tides and ripple along the surface of the earth. The ancients knew of this because many of their campaigns against fortified cities were timed for these tides. And they relied on these crustal tides to obliterate the walls of these fortified cities for what wall could withstand a 35 foot high tide of ground? We also think this might be one of the reasons Mars is referred to as the god of war. So <clears throat> these, these phenomena um, that we speak of in the sixth chapter of Revelation are nothing. This morning, I, I, as I was reviewing for today, it was it, I got the impression of God shrugging. And all God does is shrug when the earth is sent into convulsions. Our God is a is a star breather. He said, and it was. He spoke, and it became ex nihilo, out of nothing. For him to do, literally, what's being spoken of here in chapter 6 is not even breaking a sweat on the brow of our God. And there is, with all respect, a tendency to find scientific or technological 
explanations when oftentimes there are none. I'm sorry? The tie, what kind of tie is it? How's it spelled? Crustal. Crust. Like a crust of bread, A-L. And yes, you can Google it. I was trying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would recommend and do your later. And that's I why. Want, I, I just want to spell it. Jot a note. Yep, that's it. Crustal <laughs> ties. God has often made his presence felt in human history by shaking the earth. He did so when he gave the law to Israel on Mount Sinai. When Elijah called on him at the death of his son. While Paul and Silas were released from jail as a result of an earthquake. This is nothing. And not only is it nothing, it's not new. But we are now in the period of God's judgment. And so it should not surprise us that he's now using both hands to shake the earth. Second Peter chapter 3. If you got the time, turn there. We're going to do a little reading. Second Peter chapter three. We're going to start in verse five. I'll give you half a second to get there. I used to tell my classes as soon as I stop hearing the rustling of pages, I'll begin. But that doesn't fly because most of you are on your phones. So. <laughs> right. All right. Second Peter three, verses five through thirteen. <laughs> Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the coming promise? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And you poor ignorant people have been waiting 2,000 years. Where is the promise? Is there a question? That's not what mine says. Okay. <laughs> no. Second right. Peter chapter three. Is, you started yeah. at verse five. Five. Second Peter three. I started verse five. Am I in the wrong book? No. I'll begin in verse five, and you actually begin in verse five. Yeah. Really, all that's happening. All right. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Chapter three. Well, I did. Yes, I did, did start in verse one. Yeah. They wanted you to start in verse five. That's what you said. That's what I said. <laughs> well, they followed you. I hope that's all, my only mistake for the day. <laughs> yeah. Context. Thank you, Andrew. Giving you guys a context. <laughs> All right, I think we are now at verse 5. For this, they will fully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world then existed, perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. So when the Lord says, hang on a second, you better pack a, <laughs> pack a lunch. 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but instead, right? They see it as slackness. We see it as long suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This is his pattern. We look at the lineage of Adam. And we find out that within the lineage of Adam is this man named Methuselah. Methuselah lived 969 years. He is the longest living recorded individual in the scriptures. Do you know what his name means? When he dies, it will come. And Jewish tradition would have us believe that within seven days after Methuselah's death, the flood. God gave mankind time. Prior to Israel's captivity in Babylon, God gave Israel time. How much time? 490 years. 70 times they ignored the Sabbath of the land. The Sabbath of the land was, was designed to give the land a rest. Every seventh year, they were not to plant, they were not to harvest, they were not to seed, they were not to touch the land. And they ignored that for 70 of those Sabbaths. God waited 490 years for his people to, to repent before he sent them off to captivity. And now, not so much because of his lackness, or his forgetfulness, but because of his heart, not wishing that any should perish, he has delayed the coming of his son by some 2,000 years. And the scoffers want to wag their finger at that and accuse God of being slack, hardly. All right, none of that was written in here. That was all free. <laughs> Verse 10, I believe. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. God put a rainbow in the sky as a sign of his promise never to destroy the earth by water. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which the righteous dwell. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace. How? How? Let me rephrase this. What is the only way to have peace with the Almighty? Through his son. The Apostle Paul starts out every single one of the epistles that we know for sure he wrote grace and peace. No grace, no peace. You want peace with God? You must first experience the grace of God. Therefore, verse 14, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. As also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, oh boy, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware 
lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. There are a number of reasons for preferring to take this passage in its literal meaning. It seems to indicate that beginning with the sixth seal, God is undertaking a direct intervention into human affairs. The judge, judgment described here originates in God as a divine punishment inflicted upon a blasphemous world. Arthur S. Peake states, and I quote, the apocalypse is no doubt often <coughs> obscure, and its language is sometimes allegorical. But it has to be interpreted in its plain sense far more frequently than many expositors are willing to admit. Much is written in simple characters which expositors have insisted on treating as hieroglyphics. In particular, natural phenomena have been interpreted of historical events and the author has been credited with describing a political movement when he has been really speaking of God's judgments through nature. And the temptation has been especially great to find allegories where the author describes things in a manner of fact way, when the descriptions are bizarre and uncongenial to modern taste. If I don't like it, I'll spiritualize it. If I don't like it, I'll allegorize it. The words of scripture can, can be looked at, and I certainly do, as data. Basic instructions before leaving earth, the Bible. And what I know about statistics is that a statistician can torture the data to make it say whatever he wants it to say. The first rule of hermeneutics is when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, do what? Seek no other sense. The book is written in Koine Greek. Koine Greek. That is the common man's Greek. That is the beggar's Greek. That is the Greek that Alexander the Greek taught to all of his conquered armies so that they would have a language in common. This is not PhD speak. This is Manteca Bulletin speak. <laughs> When it is allegorical, when it does, when it, when there are symbols attached to it, it will let you know. And there are. I mean, I read one expositor, he said there's over 200 different labels of the spoken word or, 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 or engines or tools of the spoken word within the book of Revelation. Similes, metaphors, and there's 200 of those. So it takes, it takes astuteness. We know about the devastation of earthquakes, do we not? 1970, an earthquake in Peru took 67,000 lives. Dr. Robert Thine tells of the eruption on August 27, 1883 of Krakatau on the island in the Dutch Indies. The explosion was heard in Rodriguez, South America, 3,000 miles away. I could explain that to you. It has to do with the frequency of the sound. This is why driving in Denver, Colorado, I can hear a preacher in South Carolina trying to sell me an original piece of the cross on the AM radio because of the frequency bounces off the ionosphere, right? And you never know, whenever, wherever it comes down is where you get to hear this guy. You get to get your wallet out, your credit card. <laughs> buy a piece of the cross. As a result of the earthquake, the sun was blotted out, volcanic ash 
seems to make the moon look red and blots out the sun. After the eruption of Krakatoa, it is said that the sun was blotted from view at Batav Batavia, a hundred miles away. In Bondun, 150 miles away, the sun was also blotted out, and the moon appeared to be red. Tidal waves, ah, the unmentioned aftermath of earthquakes. The tidal waves from the eruption at Krakatoa reached as far as Cape Horn, 7,000 miles away. These are the global effects of a otherwise local earthquake. Local earthquake. Imagine what's going to happen here with the breaking of the sixth seal. So this is why I go literal rather than symbolic for, for this reason and, and many others. I got no context. I got no context here for this. I've got no context here for making it a government and not an earthquake. Hard to explain later on, and we'll get there. Hopefully this week. <laughs> he goes on to say, the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. The literal darkness of the sun will be a blackness comparable to the skin of a goat. There's nothing opaque about the skin of a goat. Thou canst see it through it. <laughs> to me, it's reminiscent of the darkness that was felt over Egypt during the plagues of Moses. And the darkness that fell for three hours in the middle of the day when Christ was suffering in our stead. This is not merely an eclipse. We've all lived through an eclipse, and you can see just fine. It's a little different, but you can see just fine. This is a blackness like goat hair. Now, what do we know about... society when there are no lights. They loot, they pillage, they plunder. So you see, there are going to be much more catastrophic events associated with the opening of the sixth seal than John writes down for you. But I suppose you can imagine if a local earthquake produces a wave that can be felt 7,000 miles away, what do you imagine this is going to do? Later on, a spoiler alert, all right? So later on, when the sun is let loose, when the restraints that God has put on the sun are lifted and things get really hot, I don't mean Death Valley hot. I mean roast a turkey hot. The ice caps will disappear, increasing the level of the oceans by an estimated 200 feet. I wonder what effect that will have on, oh, New York, San Francisco. I wonder how many lives will be lost that are not, that are not delineated here in your scriptures for you. All right? Rick? Yes? Uh, I was watching something on YouTube yesterday, and I was, like, quite amazed when we were talking about how the waters are going, and there's, so, there's like, ten big cities that are going to be under total water. New York is one of them, because their, their land is sinking. The water is rising, so the cities are sinking. So that's already in, in the mix of how the waters are going to be changing everything, what we were just reading about. So I kind of related that to what we were talking about, you know, with the waters yeah. today. So that's, you know, within 10 years, a lot of cities, at least 10 major cities throughout the world are going to be sunk in water. Just well, totally that's, that's just the natural decay yeah. of our planet. Yeah. That's yeah. not the supernatural finger of God going... <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> <laughs> As the moon is not a light generating body, we understand this, do we not? 
The moon has no light. The moon generates no light. The moon does no more than refract, reflect the light of the sun. Hence, why some of sometimes, or it might be appropriate to call us moons as we reflect the light of the sun. But it makes sense, does it not? Since the moon is not a light generating body, that any effect on the light generating body would also have a likewise effect on its reflector. Yes? Uh, just a little information here. It says, when is the next blood moon? In, in the early hours of Friday, November 19, 2021, a lunar eclipse known as the blood moon will be visible from America, Northern Europe, Eastern Asia, Australia, and Pacific. Okay. That was about the blood moon. We've seen them before. We'll see them again. <clears throat> However, right, and I'm sure you don't, take the dating of that next red moon to mean anything at all to God. <laughs> Scientist Dr. Henry M. Morris, right, explains what could cause this phenomenon. Well, if he were here, I would tell him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but with respect to his discipline and his years of study, the great earthquake described here for the first time in history is worldwide in scope. <coughs> Seismologists and geo geophysicists in recent years have learned a great deal about the structure of the earth and about the cause of and nature of earthquakes. The Earth's solid crust is transversed with a complex network of faults. Who knows this any better than we do living on the San Andreas? Yep. The Earth's solid crust, uh, let's see, with all the resting, with all the rest, resting upon a plastic mantle, whose structure is largely unknown. Whether the crust contain, consists of great moving plates is a current matter of controversy among geophysicists, so the ultimate cause of earthquakes is still not known. How about that? In all likelihood, the entire complex of crustal instabilities is a remnant of the phenomena of the great flood, especially the breakup of the fountains of the great deep. In any case, Mr. Morris goes on. The vast worldwide network of unstable earthquake belts around the world suddenly began to slip and fracture on a global basis, and a gigantic earthquake will ensue. This is evidently and naturally accompanied by <clears throat> tremendous volcanic eruptions spewing vast quantities of dust and steam and gases into the upper atmosphere. It is probably these that will cause the sun to be darkened and the moon to appear blood red, end quote. <clears throat> so the greatest brains even of our generation do not know what caused Earth's earthquakes or what the mantle is made up of. Fair enough. You got to give the guy props. Total eclipse. Of, you know. You know how long it takes to make a mountain disappear. I was there, living in Portland, when Mount St. Helens disappeared. And I'll tell you what. Portland, about 45 miles away, we heard nothing. We heard nothing because the sound bounced over Portland. It was heard in Los Angeles. We didn't hear it in Portland. We got up the next morning and it is it was like living in, in an old tube TV and somebody had taken the tent and gone vroom, and got rid of all the color. Everything was gray. I had a blue Ford Pino that was gray. The grass was gray. The asphalt was gray. My home was gray. The bushes in my yard were gray. Everything was gray. 
Gave it a dog? Oh, and guess what? It was unhealthy to go out into it. You can't breathe that ash. Why? Because it chokes you and kills you. Because it's glass. The sand and dirt of Mount St. Helens got so hard, hard it was made glass. And the glass was floating in the air. And it was unhealthy. I mean unhealthy to be breathing that junk. The total eclipse of the sun and moon will add more reason for the world to be in a panic. What chaos ensues even today with a local blackout? It's almost as if it were catnip to the lowest forms of humanity, isn't it? Lights go out, here come the cockroaches. In the Bible, the explanation of these symbols is referred to constantly as symbols of authority. On the very first page of scripture, the sun was spoken of as the ruler of the day and the moon as the ruler of the night. Remember, please remember that during this period of time, God is trying to get through to whom primarily? Israel. Well, they don't read the New Testament. They don't know what's going on. Okay, Genesis 8, that's found in their Torah, or their Hebrew Bible, verses 20 through 22. And it makes the promise that while the earth remains. Yeah? Psalm 72, 5, as long as the sun and the moon endure. And we know from reading these passages that there will come a day when that is no longer the case. Some of those answers don't come, I'm afraid, until chapter 20, 21, with the new heavens and the new earth. To the Jew, this idea was especially terrible for the order of the heavens was the very guarantee of the unchanging fidelity of God. Now things are getting all rearranged. Take away the reliability of the heavens and there was nothing left but chaos. The end will be a time when the most reliable things in the universe will become disorderly and terrifying. Stars in the sky, is this your question? Stars in the sky fall from the heavens no, it as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The word here is asteris, most often translated stars. can refer to actual stars, but can also describe and have any heavenly body, including other, I'm sorry, other than the sun and the moon. Obviously, in this context, it's just, it does not refer to actual stars. I don't know how obvious that is, but based on what we currently know, since they are far too large to fall to the earth and would incinerate it long before striking it. Now, here's the thing, too. Consider not only the size, and Louis, G Louis Giglio goes through this, in a very clear and succinct format where the earth is the size of a pea and the sun is the size of a basketball. And what is the nearest, Alpha Centauri, the nearest star we know, is the size of the earth compared to the size of the basketball. If these things started to fall into earth, you buy earth. And we know that Earth does not go goodbye here. Also consider that some of them are millions of light years away. I don't want to wait millions of light years to have the stars from over the sky. So more than likely, I'm not saying for sure, more than likely what John is seeing here are meteorites. 
probably not even an asteroid. An asteroid of any sign would be referred to by scientists as a planet killer. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Right. Yeah. So more than likely, it's a meteorite shower. We have meteorite showers going on all the time. And our atmosphere takes care of the majority of them. The moon does not have such an atmosphere, and it looks like it's got acne, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> this all popped up and beat the daylights. God thought of everything. Luke 21, 11 says, he talks of the fearful and great signs from heaven. This is a picture our Lord uses, a great wind. A great wind would hasten the fall of, you know, one of the things that's unique, I don't know about how unique it is because I'm not a farmer, I do not have a green thumb. If you want to kill, let me touch it. It will die in your garden. <laughs> but as I understand it, fig trees sprout leaves and fruit at the same time. So if you see a fig tree with leaves, you would expect it to have fruit. Ring any bells? Does it ring bells? No. Yeah. Did our Lord find a fig tree without any fruit? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, what did he do to it? <laughs> Cursed it. Cursed it. Poor fig tree. Yeah. Not hardly. In that particular case, it was a symbol of his nation who had been given the responsibility to bring the fruit of God's presence and awareness and salvation, not only to their brethren, but to the entire world. And although they had the outer accoutrements, they had the religion. They had no fruit. And God cursed them by way of the fig tree. He called them the blind leading the blind, did he not? He called them a lot of things. <laughs> he called them empty sepulchers. <laughs> you know what a sepulcher is, right? It's a grave. Yeah. All white and shiny on the outside, but P-U inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the wind is frequently the symbol of such judgment. It was a wind that blasted the seven lean ears of corn. Right? Yes. Yeah, verse 13. Of what chapter? Uh, we're in ver uh, chapter 6, Revelation. Are we at verse 13 yet? Uh, the yeah. stars of the sky fell to the earth. Okay. Okay. So I'll make sure you're not working ahead of me. <laughs> no, sir, right on the same. I'm, I'm with you, buddy. Okay. okay. All right. Let her rip. Check this out. Okay. So you're talking figurative and, liter and literal. Yeah. Okay. So let's say, and the stars, let's say they're the wise of the world, the people that are in charge of whatever's, okay? Could be religious leaders. Well, we know they're not. Okay. But, okay. Because we get, to those, we get to those folks later. Okay. Right. So it says, and the stars of the sky. So this, in a literal thing, the stars from the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree. So in my head, I've got Israel and all that they thought okay, it's just going to fall to the ground when shaken by a gale, the Holy Spirit. Am I way off? No, I don't think you're way off. But, um, but, I, but I think where you have gone yeah. is application <coughs> rather than exegesis. Correct. Okay? Yes, sir. All right. And so as we have discussed in this class, um, I believe that the scripture has one meaning. Nobody writes a letter with multiple choice unless they tell you it's multiple choice, do they? I'm going to write something for you and you can take it however you want to take it. Really? You ever read a book like that? You ever write a letter like that? No, God intended to say something by what he wrote. 
and it's up to us to, to decipher if we can, and sometimes we can. Well, it could mean this, it could mean that. Well, I agree, it could mean this, and it could mean that. But it can't mean both. So put on your big boy pants because one of us has to be wrong. And that's a word we don't use in our society today, is it? But when you read letters from an author over and over and over, you begin to hear their heart's intent. I would absolutely agree. Okay. So. And wouldn't it even be better if you could have, have a regular <clears throat> breakfast with that author? Absolutely. Yeah. Which I try to on a daily basis. There you go. You I know, do it. So there you go. As I, as... I read his letters to me, and I take them very personal. Um, sometimes there, my author is asking me to apply sometimes my own brain, the one he created, to, you know, like, hey, Suze, what about this? Because he knows I like to think about a lot of stuff. It really has no meaning whatsoever. But he and I have conversations like that all, all the time. Hey, you know, all the time. Head. Lord. And I'm not saying I'm absolutely right or absolutely wrong, but around my dinner table, we were taught to think for ourselves also. Sure, absolutely. And, and I, will, I will acquiesce, I will agree to that with this caveat. Based on my not yours, but yours too. Based on my level of maturity, I will get different answers from the exact same <laughs> statement. Right? Yes, sir. Because at six, I'm only capable of understanding so much. At 12, I'm capable, you would hope, of understanding a little bit more. Mm -hmm. As an adult, by golly, Right? And, the wise old woman was and so you can see how <laughs> the same statement in Scripture could mean different things to you in different areas of your maturity. And that is completely understandable. And it is up to, and we, we see this in Scripture, it is up to those who are mature, whoever they are, to be patient and compassionate and bring those who are not as mature along. Well, to me it means this, okay? I can see, and no disrespect, and no hurt, no, no hurt intended, but I can see as a six-year-old why you would think that. I really can, I get it. I was six, I thought that same thing. I'm not six anymore, so let me, as a theoretically mature believer, help you along with what that really means. Well, that's that's the that's that's my that's our objective as te as teachers, and we talked about that. Sandy's not here, is she? No. No. We talked about that. I think last Sunday, did we not? When I look out here, I see experience. A lot. Lots of it. <laughs> but is that a fair assessment from a spiritual perspective? Absolutely not. One, because we're all individuals. Two, because we've all been gifted differently. And three, because we're all in different stages or states of our spiritual maturity. And all of that must be, that, that comes from being in tune with the Holy Spirit. It does not come through these, as we talked about. It comes through this. And so I can appreciate how you might think this means this. I really can, because I was once there. But, but, but as a guy who's been around the block just a couple more times, maybe biblically speaking, <clears throat> let me enrich your understanding of what that truly does mean. And the idea, and hopefully it comes across this way, because I can be rather blunt at times, 
as I found out this morning from my dear wife. Can you still see the mark? <laughs> it's not so much here, but right here. <laughs> Although we may be blunt, our intention is to make you thirsty for God's Word. To dispel this nonsense about semantics. There's a place and time for that, I suppose. But if you want my heart on the matter, it is the refuge of a lazy man. Well, that's just semantics. Really. I'd appreciate that position if you've done even a little bit of homework. The more I study this book, and this is the third time I've gone through it formally in a classroom, the stupider I am. <laughs> the less I know, the dumber I get. We spent three years in a home life group, did we not, studying the tabernacle. And I assure you, we did nothing but scratch the surface. So what we're doing, <laughs> what we're doing here with copious notes, is trying to make you thirsty. Hopefully, we're not giving you too much salt since you spit it out. <laughs> so that could happen. All right, we have to stop here. Time says we do, and we will uh, resume. We've covered the stars, I hope. Unless there are questions. And I love the question. Are there any questions? Barry? Comments. Is when do you Thursday to leave if you're coming? Do you need your showers? Oh, oh. This is a major one. Okay. Four classes. This is a class one. Okay. Uh, so after midnight, you can get earlier in the morning. Meet your shower. Meet your shower. Yeah. This is great. I remember one of my best friend and our two daughters. Wednesday, Thursday. This is like 20 years ago. We, we set out in the Orchards of Livermore and watch showers of meteorites. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you, and you know, like a lot of things, it's not the ones you see that can hurt you. Yeah, right. Right? Because the ones you see are being burned up in the atmosphere. Exactly. Those nasty little buggers that get through unseen. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Katie? <laughs> because they use the planet Mars to plan their campaigns of war against fortified cities. All right? So Mars, Mars was thought of in that Oriental culture of being a god that would help them knock down the walls over here. Why well, hear Mars? I think Greek, so I was trying to put that. Yeah, fair enough. Greek. Mars. So Mars was a god of war for somebody, right? Roman. Yeah. What was he called? In what, what the Greek? Because the Greeks always Ares. Because the Greeks always had a counterpart or a different name. And sometimes they're actually called both because associated one more with one. That makes sense. <laughs> A rose by any other name, right? Yeah. An idol by any other name. Anybody else? So you don't believe in the Aquinas and Augustine's teachings of lenses of layers of biblical understanding? Okay, I didn't hear the question. So you don't believe in Augustine and Aquinas' teachings of the lenses and layers of biblical understanding, which is literal and metaphorical and about teaching? Oh, sure, absolutely. Absolutely, I do. But I think the text is clear. When you switch gears. When are you to switch gears? And not at your liking. The question had to do with literal, metaphorical, and... Analogical. 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 Right. And I believe that the text will tell you when to shift gears. You don't shift gears when it's convenient. Right? Those tools are not, were not designed for us 
to make things fit the way we want them. Because God seldom allows us to do that. He's kind of outside the box. Huh. Right, right. Literally. 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 Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for our time together. Uh, it is a time that we treasure. It's a time that we look forward to all week long. We thank you for the message that we received this morning about gifts and how to use them and that we should use them. We pray for those amongst our little group here that are not with us today. If they're out um, on business or pleasure, we hope that those trips are successful. For those who are not with us because of illness or for any other reason, we pray that you would see fit to bring them back to us. Keep them safe in the process. We're looking forward to your coming. We're looking forward to you getting us out of here. But again, until you do, we pray you find us faithful to be busy about the business that you set aside in advance for us to do. We give you praise. We give you thanks. It is such an amazing thing to be able to kick open the throne room, the doors of the throne room, and speak to Creator God. So we do that, and as Hebrews 4 says it, we do it confident, confidently, holding firmly to the faith we profess. In all of this, we give thanks and credit and gratitude to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, hope to see you all next week.